So we're going to continue the Gemara. We're on 50 B2, correct? Correct. Okay. We learned in a brisa. What's what does the brisa say? Four things were said concerning bread. We love these things. They're general rules. This is good ideas and things that we need to know with regards to whatever it is. And today it's with regards to bread. We don't place Raw meat on bread. Remember, this is 17, 1800 years ago. Today, we know a lot of things about food preparation and food safety that they perhaps didn't know. So we have to put this in perspective and say, wow, it's amazing that this is what they what, what they cared about in a time that people had no idea. Though, if you want to know, Rabbeinu Yonah says that the reason why we don't do it is because it makes the bread repulsive. We don't pass a full cup over the bread. What does that mean? That we it, that Rashi says that it might spill on the bread and degrade it. We don't throw bread. I'm sorry to the Sephardim who uh, sometimes uh, do that uh, as a tradition. Uh, do not, if you have a tradition, don't uh, let your tradition, don't don't let the Talmud get in the way of your tradition, but it says do not throw bread. And uh, Tosva says that even where there's no concern, the bread will be ruined. That means it'll land on a plate. The very act of throwing is considered degrading and is prohibited. So we don't throw bread. And we don't support a plate with bread. We don't put it under uh, a plate to support it. Why? Because the contents might spill on the bread and render it repulsive. Four things that we don't do with bread. That's a little story, a little incident. Amemar and Marzutra of Ashi, they're eating bread together. I say the Kamehu, Tamri, Birimoine, dates and pomegranates were brought before them. Shokel Marzutra, Posach, Vakame, the Ravashi, the Sidna, Marzutra took a portion of the cooked meat and he threw it in front of Ravashi. He threw it. Omarle, Ravashi says to him, don't you know what the Bryce has said that you don't throw food? That we don't throw food? So what does Marzutra say? He says, oh, that Bryce is with regards to bread, but other foods we can throw. Because if the Bryce wanted to say all food, it would have said all food. But no, it just said bread. Well, <laughs> Tanya. Ravashi persists. He says, but we learned in a bride, just as we may not throw bread, so too we can't throw other foods. There's another bride that says, oh, you were trying to get out of it. Amar Lei, Marsutra says, Tanya, I'm going to give you, I'm, yeah, you think that's good? I'm going to throw you a different bride. Although we can't throw bread, we can throw other foods. Ella, like Kasha, the Talmud says there's no contradiction. Why? Because the Brisa that prohibits throwing foods other than bread is dealing with something that is rendered repulsive. When it's thrown, like a, a fully ripened fig, says Rashi, or berries that get squashed when they're thrown. But the Brisa that's talking about that you can throw other foods that, that are not bread is dealing with something that is not rendered repulsive when thrown, like pomegranates, like walnuts, like hard foods, says Rashi. 
Can you imagine this this debate? He throws food at him. He's trying to make a joke, and then they're throwing prices at each other. Just to be able to, to, to justify what he just did. Can you imagine your whole life you're using prices to justify your actions? It's like a whole it's a whole different scene of Animal House and John Belushi right? in my head. It's, yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> it's called Brysa House. <clears throat> no, I can't imagine. So 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 we have this whole thing. I mean, again, today it's a little bit shocking to us because who's throwing Anything today is with regards to food, but they they would throw. I mean, there was a there was a tradition that um, during uh, during the Tisha B'av, as people were sitting and lamenting, they would throw lentils at them. I don't know. There's there's, a, there's different traditions of throwing various things. It must have been a a, a term of endearment during that time <laughs> to to throw food. Rabbi, I would imagine the uh, translation would not have been throwing, it would have been casting. Mm. And cast, casting has multiple meanings to it. So um, uh, it has positive and negative forms of casting uh, and and uh, in different situations. So I, I can see the complexity. I, I actually have a question that rises from this. Um, so a brysa. A brysa is an unattributed statement that has gone through, that has developed into people's language and culture and, and, and carried on through other chachams, through other people who use it and remember it. Um, but we've, we're living in a time of false information where uh, a lot of people deal with unreferenced statements. A lot of them are untrue. And they say... I heard it said that with no reference, it could be completely false. And yet people accept that as, as a little fact, perhaps true. And I wonder if Brysa, Brysas are at risk of that being unattributed, um, uh, except to a period of time, of falsehoods being uh, thrown through them. So I, it's just something that's come up in my mind. Has that been talked about? Well, I, I think today, looking in, you know, hindsight is everything. Today, we have the attribution of the Talmud. Attribution of? The Talmud. They're the prices are in the Talmud. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. But the, And that's the reference source. Fair enough. Right. Well, we wouldn't have them otherwise, and the Talmud, I think, is enough of an attribution at this point in the world that it would it would justify them being uh, not false information because it's so much. It was written at a time where they knew it, and it was close to the source. But today, there's a big so, issue of, of, of not asking. The decline of our of our uh, social networks uh, from the Talmud time to today is I cannot accept anymore. I heard someone say, I read something. I need attribution because there's too much um, falsehoods that are that are attributed to, I heard it, I read it. Where at this point in history, as we're talking, in the Talmudic times, we don't have this problem. Fair enough, thank you. Tanur Abonam. Second paragraph of 50b3. The rabbis taught in the price. Mamshikin Yayin did see nudis if ne chosn if ne kala. It says me that we may let wine flow through the pipes before the groom and before the bride. What are we talking about? So go to Rashi, note number 26. As a good sign to indicate that their tranquility and good fortune should continue to flow. The wine is caught in vessels at the end of a pipe, and thus there is no de uh, degradation or wasting of food. So there was obviously some kind of thing that people would do at wedding celebrations. Okay, so let's talk about wedding celebrations, uh, Jewish wedding celebrations. The entire purpose of a Jewish wedding celebration is to bring joy to the bride and groom. And so there are stories of great rabbis that would juggle in front of the bride and groom and different uh, uh, circus acts that they would do. 
And apparently there's this story of they would take some kind of pipe and they would let wine flow through the end of the pipe and they would kind of fill a glass with it. I guess it was some kind of trick that they would do. Where there was a pipe and there was wine and there was a glass and they bring the glass to the bride and groom. I don't know how it worked, but I'm trying to to picture it in my head. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to say this because of my college experience. It sounds like a beer bong. Just a, just a little bit. <laughs> so there was a wine, there was a wine bong of some sort. And it was a it was a trick that they would do uh, for the bride and groom to to make them laugh. The zerk and nehem kuloyes v'gizim bimoyis hachama, and they and and we can throw before the bride and groom toasted grain and walnuts in the summer. Avoloy bimoyis hagushamim, but not in the winter. Why? So they would I guess they when the when the bride and groom were coming they would throw things up you know in, in the streets. Uh, to 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 usher them. So Rashi says, in the summer the streets aren't muddy, and the foods are rendered repulsive if they go get into the mud during the winter. And we we don't want to waste the food. We're just doing it in a way to 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 bring joy. So they would throw the foods. And you can't throw baked rolls before them, neither in the summer nor in the winter. Why? Because the moment a roll gets to the ground, Rashi says it's considered repulsive. So you know you're having all this joy, but you also don't want to waste the food. It's very hard today. It's the seventeenth of Tammuz, and it's a fast day. And we're talking about food, so anyway, it is what it is. Also makes me think about what a privileged time we live in. Yeah, I mean, no one would think twice about wasting a roll. Sorry. To say now, that again. Imagine today we'd, we'd, we'd throw lentils in a second or whatever, the walnuts and grain in a second. So it's true at that time. But at that time, you know, the people who were throwing the grains are the people who, who harvest the grains. So they felt, you know, they, they weren't buying the grain in aisle two. They were harvesting it. So they felt the, the work of their labor. They weren't just, uh, you know, this is so maybe we should go back to that. And, and the Gemara now continues to talk about these foods and, and, and repulsive and non-repulsive. Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda says, Shachach v'hichnes oichlem v'seich piv b'loi v'racha. You forgot to, if you forgot and mistakenly put food into your mouth without, without reciting a blessing. You, you, you forgot to make the blessing and you, you put food in your mouth. Mis, misalkam v'tzad echad m'varech. He should shift to the food to one side of his mouth and make the blessing. Just put it at one side of your mouth and make the blessing. It's Tanya Chada. We learned in a brisa, if you put food in your mouth without reciting a blessing, you swallow it without reciting the blessing. The Tanya Idach. We learned in a, another brisa, Peltan. You spit it out, and then you recite the blessing and eat it. The Tanya Idach, and we taught another brisa, Misalkan. You shift it. So what do you do? Do you swallow it? Do you spit it out, or do you shift it? The Gemara now answers this contradiction. What do you do if you forget the blessing and you put the food in your mouth? Loi kasha, there's no contradiction. Why? Hatanya beloyin. The price of a talk that he swallows it. He's talking about with liquids. You can't spit out the liquids. Right? You can, you can, you're permitted to swallow a liquid, Rashi says, without reciting a blessing. Because it's impossible to shift it to one side of the mouth and recite a blessing. And it's unfeasible to spit it out. That would render it repulsive and you won't, you won't drink it again. So that's, so with regards to swallowing it, that's a liquid. Latanya potin. With regards to spitting it out, what is it? Be me. He's dealing with something that is not rendered repulsive when put in the mouth and spit out. Like let's say you put a, a, a walnut in your mouth and spit it out. You can you can eat the walnut again. Something like that. Like a hard candy. The Hatanya Misalkan, and the one that says he shifts it to, to shifts it to one side of his mouth and then makes the blessing and then eats it bimidi mimis, he's talking about something that is rendered repulsive. And if you if you if you spit it out of your mouth, you're not going to want to eat it again. Let's say you put a piece of meat or something like that in your mouth. A berry. A grape, something like that. Now we continue 51A1. The midi, the loy mi misnami. What about 
with regards to something that's not rendered repulsive when you put it in your mouth. What about that situation? The salkinu v'tzad echad v'livarech. It should shift it to one side of his mouth and then make the blessing. So why should he spit it out and then make the blessing? He could just shift it to one side of his mouth and make the blessing. The Gemara says, Targumar Rav Yiskot, Kas Kasa, Tamei Rav Yaisi, Bar Oven, Nishmei Rav Yechman, Yitzhak Bar Kas Kasa explained in the name of Rav Yaisi, but Oven, in the name of Rav Yechman, Mishum Shenemar, Yemolei Pi Tilasecha, because he said, my mouth shall be filled with your praise. What does that mean? This is King David in Psalm 71. This verse teaches that when you praise Hashem, you should have nothing else in your mouth other than the praise so that it can be enunciated and it can be enunciated clearly and properly. Very important. Anytime chewing gum, whatever it is, if you're praying to Hashem, so in this case, you're making a blessing to Hashem. Why is he spitting it out? Because quoting the verse of King David, that whenever you're praising Hashem, you should have nothing else in your mouth. And that is why we keep, uh, we, we spit out the item and then make the blessing. We good so far? Yes. Okay. They asked the question of Rav Chizda. Somebody who ate and drank but did not recite a blessing beforehand. What is the law? Should they make a blessing after they already ate and drank or not? Big problem. You finished your meal, but you didn't make a blessing beforehand. Amar Luhu, Rav Chizda said to them, Misha Achol Shum Vareyach Noidiv. If you ate a garlic clove so that your breath smells, you should go back and eat another garlic so that your breath will smell even more. What does that mean? This is a, 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 a analogy. He says, are you suggesting that a person who ate without reciting a blessing should repeat the sin even more without reciting a blessing? So for sure, he should continue, he should make a blessing before he continues eating. What's the question? I don't understand the question. He forgot, he forgot. No, now make a blessing and continue. Amar Ravina, Ravina says, So if you finished your meal, you should go back and recite the blessing. Why? Because Rashi says, since one who did not recite the blessing prior to the meal can do so during the meal, that even someone who finished the meal can recite a blessing. Tanya, how are we going to say this? Because we learned in a bright set. You immersed yourself and you came out of the mikvah. Amar said. And right after they came out, he says, what do they say? You make the blessing of, 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 of on, the, on the immersion in the mitzvah. So you can recite the blessing for immersion even after performing the mitzvah. The same thing, you can make the blessing on the food even after eating the food. That's the that's the, the proof that they're taking. Let's just understand this. The question is, is the blessing of food valid only when recited before they start to eat? Or is it also valid once you ate or even after you ate? Look at note number four. Ravina did not deduce this ruling on the basis of the price itself, because he too understood that the blessing over food might differ from the blessing over immersion and be valid only when recited before the ble- the, 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 the begins to eat. But since Rav Chista ruled that the blessing over food is valid even when recited after you begin eating, he concludes that like the blessing over immersion, it's a va- it's it's valid even after you finish eating. Gemara is not going to like this. Like we I don't think the Gemara says this is a valid comparison. There, prior to the immersion, the person is unfit for reciting the blessing. Therefore, the time for its recital is after the immersion. So, let's explain. Go to note number five. The most common case of immersion is that of a balkari. What is a balkari? A man who experiences seminal discharge. 
In earlier times, such a person was forbidden to study Torah or recite blessings prior to the immersion. Since the one immersing was ineligible to recite the blessing prior to immersion, they would recite it after the immersion. That is the reason why they would recite the blessing after the immersion. Here, before the ble- before the person was fit to be able to recite the blessing, that's why they just forgot the blessing. And since he finished eating and was excluded from reciting the blessing, then they should not be reciting the blessing. So the Gemara says, that particular case, you're using an example of tefillah, the person couldn't make a blessing. That's why they're doing it after the immersion. Here, the person could make a blessing. So you should not be able to do it after the immersion. A blessing should be in the proper place, says the Gemara. If you already ate the food, you can't make a blessing that you would make before the food. So you can't go back in time, essentially. You can't go back in time. Okay. okay. Good. Okay. You ready? We're getting into a fun Gemara, uh, uh, Dr. Kravitz. We're getting into a medical Gemara. <clears throat> Here we go. The Talmud on medicine. Um, Espargus. What is Espargus? Rashi says it's a blend of undiluted wine or beer with cabbage. Just so you know what it is. Tan Rabbanon, the rabbis taught in the price, uh, Espargus, Espargus, this undiluted beer or wine with cabbage, is beneficial for the heart and it's good for the eyes. The Choshekain live Neimayim, and certainly it's good for the intestines. The Choshekain. And certainly it's good for the sentence. And if you're accustomed to drinking it regularly, it's beneficial for your entire body. But one who gets drunk from it, it's detrimental for your whole body. Doctor, what are your thoughts? Well, let's uh, be scientific. What is the spargus? It's, uh, it's undiluted wine or beer with cabbage. Um, so what they're, uh, people would drink it in the morning on an empty stomach. Right. Um, so the, so tell me what the issue is because it's very clear what they wrote. There's no issue. It's just fascinating. So they're saying this is good for health. What they're saying is the, the, um, the mixture has pieces that are good for health. And pieces that are not. Well, well, in excess. In excess, it won't be good. Exactly. So it's a matter of, uh, of uh, amount. Um, I have, cabbage has, you know, can be uh, not just the wine. If you overeat uh, cabbage, there can be digestive problems. Um, but um, I've never associated cabbage with vitamin A, uh, so I'll, I'm looking that up, because why is it good for the eyes, etc. So, uh, I have no medical comment on it. Um, I'm just accepting what is written as uh, ethics from the sages. Ethics from the sages is what we have. The the Yafalalev, the crisis says it's beneficial for the heart. Miklau Dvechamra Askinan it's evident that we're dealing with asparagus made with wine. Because why? Because if you look at Rashi, Rashi says, the Gemara below, in resolving the contradiction between two brises regarding the therapeutic benefits and harmful side effects of asparagus, concluded that one brisa, which says asparagus is beneficial for the heart, the eyes and the spleen, is discussing asparagus made with wine. And the brisa, which says asparagus is good for the heart, is discussing the one made with wine. So the one made with beer, with, with, as opposed to beer, the one for made with beer apparently is not as health beneficial. The Katani kosher came with Neimayim, and the Bryce says it certainly is good for the intestines. The, the one made with wine is good for the intestines. But Tanya, we learned in a Bryce, Le'et Yafe, Spargus made with wine is beneficial for Le'at, for, for Le'at, which means, what is that? An acronym for Lev, Ayin, and Tachol. The heart, the eye, and the spleen. 
It's a term that they would use as lat, which is um, heart, eyes, and spleen. The ramat kosher, and it's detrimental for the ramat. What is the ramat? The ramat is the rush, the head, the ma'ayin, the intestines, and tachtuna is the hemorrhoids, says Rashi. So it's good for the heart, eyes, and spleen, and it's bad for the head, the intestines, and the, and the hemorrhoids. Titania hahi, with regards to what the first Bryce had taught, with regards to the asparagus made with aged wine, which infects the intestines differently from that which is made with regular wine. Right, old wine is is uh, what does old wine mean? It's wine that came from the previous year. The Tanan we learned in the Mishnah, a person said, "Kona wine that I shall taste." Because wine is detrimental for the intestines. So the person is suffering from intestinal difficulties caused by excessive drinking of wine. Lacking the fortitude to refrain from drinking voluntarily, he made a vow to prohibit himself from wine. This is pre-AA. Amrulai, those hearing the vow said to him, but aged wine is beneficial for the intestines. There's no reason you should prohibit yourself from drinking aged wine. The Shasak and he was silent, meaning that he agreed. He's forbidden to drink new wine, but he can he can drink aged wine. So much for AA. I thought here this was the beginning of uh, of proof. You know, maybe he was uh, having problems from excessive drinking, but uh, apparently they said there's a difference between new wine and aged wine. And he said, yeah. And then he was allowed the aged wine, but not the new wine. What do we learn from this? Shema Mina. We learn from this that aged wine is different than new wine, and it's beneficial for the intestines. So we go back to the asparagus. The asparagus that's made with aged wine is beneficial for the intestines. So, Rabbi, uh, to answer your question, there has to be, I, I look forward to doing this a significant research into the properties uh, at that at the Talmudic time of the various components of the mixture and the various diseases and states um, because they're so multifactorial that uh, it would be interesting to uh, uh, take onion pills off your question to sort of look at it. But that would take a significant amount of time and I am going to begin that process. Okay. So I have no your statement, but I look forward to reading more of that. Please keep us posted. But there's one thing that came to mind about um, when they were talking about the hemorrhoids and uh, intestines, you know, excess drinking can cause this in Chinese medicine, you know, like damp heat and it can cause things to sink so hemorrhoids so i i definitely heard a correspondence there but i don't i definitely need to understand more about the difference between um the chemical properties of a new wine versus an aged wine right like i wonder if there's toxins in the tannins or i don't know i don't know but also well, remember there's no sulfites then ah so it's something to think about The unicorn is intrigued. Unicorn is the best. We love it. We love our unicorn. The unicorn in front and the unicorn in back. Okay. Tanur Rabbanan. The rabbis taught in the Brisa. Shisha Dvarim Nemrum Ba'afargus. Oh, we have good stuff here. Six things were said concerning the Aspargus. You ready? One does not drink it unless it is made with undiluted wine and the cup is full. That's the first thing. And you receive the cup in your right hand and you drink it with your left hand. Wow, there's a lot of uh, specifics about this asparagus. The ain mashikin akhara, the ain mas mafsikin boy, and you don't speak after drinking it, and you don't interrupt while drinking it. Oh, okay. 
You drink the entire cup in one gulp, and it's improper etiquette to drink an entire cup at once. But the Brisa teaches with regards to asparagus, you have to drink the cup without interruption in order for it to have its therapeutic effect. Okay, we're getting a little hoodie here. The aim is shichin, acharag, the aim of seeking, um, uh, seeking, but you don't drink after, you don't uh, interrupt. The aim machzirin oisei ela lemi shinasnelei. After drinking it, you do not return the cup to anyone other than the person that gave it to you. The rak acharag, and you spit after drinking it. The ain sem kan oisei ela biminoi, and you supplement it only with its own kind. Which means, asparagus, Rashi says, being an alcoholic beverage, which is drunk on an empty stomach, weakens the one who drinks it, and he has to eat immediately afterwards. The Bryce says that one should supplement it with its own kind, food from which the main ingredient in the asparagus is processed. The implication is that after drinking wine, you should eat grapes. So, so Rabbi, um, the I, uh, to go against the, the heebie-jeebie uh, and whatnot. Um, the language here is very much Eastern med Islamic uh, and, uh, and uh, Chinese medical concepts. Uh, and the transfer from left to right is flow of and I can, I can read the sources of uh, biblical medicine at that time uh, generating these acts, um, and perhaps the spitting in the cup was to uh, put your name on the cup so no one else would touch it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, and so that there's it's some uh, there's some uh, protection against uh, passing it around and viral transmission, whatever. As I said, there's a lot of research that has to go into this that I look forward to. Uh, but the language is very uh, appropriate for the system of medicine at that time. Um, it's, it's not um, sort of magical. It's very, um, um, it, 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 it's a very common language describing medical approaches at that time. Right. And, and uh, so the left, they're talking about the benefit for the heart, the transfer from the right hand to the left hand before drinking, uh, the, the concepts of, uh, of heart and circulation um, uh, that, that's consistent with it at that time, um, uh, taking a, a flush because you're essentially flushing the, the esophagus, stomach and intestines by taking the whole cup um, you're, uh, it's a strong wine, so it's not diluted. And you said wines at that time were, were high alcohol content so that there are uh, lots of vascular and uh, hepatic responses to that. It, there's a real complexity here that I wouldn't throw out by saying he be um, uh, It would be interesting to mm, uh, translate the language of the time the medical language into a more modern understanding. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I was I was uh, saying a little tongue in cheek to heebie jeebie, but I, I totally agree with you. But, so, yeah. do you think this would kind of equate to you know people who do the the shot of um apple cider vinegar in, sort of in the morning, like a mm -hmm. something like this that. idea of getting some similar, systems, yeah. Yeah. yeah, or some people do like lemon lemon and hot water, cayenne, yeah, yeah, the cayenne well, cayenne shot. Part of what I look forward to is what time of day was this sort of de rigueur for the era? Was this a morning? Uh, it was morning before you ate. It said that it, it, it said that you it, did it. It did say it was in the morning. Yeah, yeah it, said it, it said it was in the morning before you ate. Okay. So, yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Okay. But Tanya, the Gemara continues and says, we learned in a different price, uh, Ain, same thing, it's a little bit You don't um, supplement asparagus only with bread. You put it with bread. Like Kasha, the Gemara says, there's no difficulty. Uh, this price, which says that one supplements asparagus with bread, is dealing with asparagus made from wine. But the other one that says that it's made, that, that, that you're dealing with uh, its own kind, is made from beer. So we have two different kinds of asparagus. 
So after drinking, and by the way, beer, by the way, is often in the Talmudic times was fig beer. So, you, so it's not talking beer. about beer from hops. Yeah, it was beer from figs. And you cool. should eat figs after eating um, asparagus that's made with beer. Sorry. Yeah, I, I, I just realized that probably you thought it was with hops, but actually it's with figs. You know, the, the most common form was uh, araki. Yeah, which is date, which is date based. Date and it's, it's, yeah, yeah, date beer and fig beer exactly were very popular during that time. Yeah, and so and I'm, I'm a little lost though. This was this was this the thing that was um, cabbage infused? Yeah. Cabbage, yes, it was beer or wine with cabbage. Okay. So was it? Do you think it was fermented, or was it not that? Like, was it not kind of? Did it not make that transition? I don't know. Huh. Probably cabbage was often eaten fermented, so that would make sense that it was fermented. So that's also, you know, we know how good for the gut that Sour, is. So yeah, yeah, sauerkraut. It was like sauerkraut with with wine. I'm sorry. Is the, I didn't realize it was a fasting day. This must be really a challenging. No, you know, okay. I'm not interested in sour and sauerkraut with wine. We're talking about okay, like yeah. dinner rolls, then maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tane Chada, the Bryce had taught Laat Yafe, asparagus is beneficial for, for the high, the heart and the eyes and the spleen. The Ramat Kosha, but it's detrimental for the head, the intestines, and the hemorrhoids. The Tani Idach, we learned in another Bryce, the Lamach, the Ramat Yafe, that it's good for the head, intestines, and hemorrhoids, Laat Kosha, and it's detrimental for the heart, the eyes, and the spleen. Like Kasha, it's no difficulty. Habachamra, the one that says it's detrimental is dealing with one from wine. The hashuka and the one that says that it's good is dealing with one from the beer, from the figure of a date beer. So we can see clearly that there's two very different drinks that people would drink. One was with the figure date beer and the other one with the wine. And different ones were detrimental or helpful or beneficial, depending on where they were. Depending what on I, and as, as I look forward to undertaking uh, more reading about this, there is one aspect that jumps out. Um, in many cases, food is neutral. It's not beneficial. It's not detrimental. It's essential. Um, and, um, and, and, and the essential part of it is that it follows uh, cycles and, and uh, tides and whatnot of very complex neuroendocrine aspects of the gut. Uh, and whatnot. It's interesting that for asparagus, they're talking about it's a benefit, it's a detriment. They're making it into a medical pill, right? Or a, so it becomes a a prescription approach. But I don't know at this point for what, uh, for what condition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It'll be interesting. All yeah, the books that I uh, you got for me from Rosen. Um, and I'll start to look them up. Yeah, I think that, I think I'm sure they'll have asparagus in it, especially the one that's uh, the the medicine in the Bible and Talmud that you have. Oh, it might be right here. I'll show people the title. Please continue. Yeah, the one that Rosner did. I think it's a. a that sounds cool. It's a, a green colored cover. Yeah, good memory. Right? Or a turquoise yeah. colored cover. Doctor Kravitz, I have. I, I do have to admit I have feelings of jealousy when I see your library. I'm a, I'm a kind of a, a book lover. So this is library goals back behind you here for me. Celeste, please come over and help me read them because I read slowly, so I feel bad <laughs> or left uh, unread as yet. Just so you know, the, the library is not very old, and uh, it's a it's, it's a new uh, addition to Dr. Kravitz's life. You know, it's how what is it four years old? So they're only four or five years old. Yeah, it's actually you're right on. Yeah, uh, I'll try to pull out the book. Please continue. I'll find this. I think it might be upstairs. Okay, that's good. It means that it was used. Very much so. It, it's a uh, 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 Rosner's an amazing person. Okay, I'll do it as part of my research. Okay. Wonderful. Hone Fada. Another Brisa taught, if someone spits after drinking asparagus, they will be harmed. Which means if he's spitting the saliva gathered after the, spar this, 
this this bargus. The Tanya and another one, Idach taught another brisa of Rach Achrav Leiker, and he, he, if he does not spit after drinking it, he's going to be harmed. <laughs> like Kasha, the Gemara says, there's no question. Haba Chamra, Haba Shifra. The one that is talking about that if you spit after asparagus is dealing with asparagus made with wine. And the one that says that it's harmful not to spit afterwards is talking about the one made from beer. So we see, once again, the difference between the two drinks. Amar Ravashi, Ravashi says, Now that you have said that if one does not spit after drinking, you'll be harmed, of it's water, which means the saliva which gathers in your mouth after drinking asparagus is made from beer. And one should not spit out even when you're standing before a king. What does that mean? Rashi says, one should spit out the saliva in the king's presence rather than endanger themselves by swallowing it. The, I guess the king's presence is like even is the ultimate state of something you don't want to spit in front of a king. But even so, it says that you, it says that you should spit it out because it's very dangerous to your health. It, it strikes me that your health will be in jeopardy if you spit in front of the king. Yeah. Well, in a different way. <laughs> yes. Okay. Amr Rabbi Shmuel ben Elisha. Rabbi Shmuel ben Elisha says, we turn to 51A3. Shloisha Devarim Sach Li Suriel Sarapanim. Three things were told by Suriel Sarapanim. Who is this? Who is this person? This person is the prominent angel. The Brisa discusses, uh, so there was an angel, his name was Suriel Sarhapanim. Do not take your shirt in the morning from the hand of the butler and get dressed. Which means when getting dressed in the morning, do not have the butler hand you your shirt, but rather take the shirt yourself from where it's prepared and put it on. Do not have your hands washed by someone who has not washed their own hands. The person who washes your hands should already have washed their own hands. Do not return the asparagus cup to anyone other than the person who gave it to you. Because the tachsefis, which is a group of demons, or as others say it, the Istalganis Shomachi Chabala, the Istalganis, which is the group of angels of affliction, they wait for a person and they say, When will a person come to do one of these things and be ensnared? Okay, we've got some good stuff here. You have to give the Spargus cup back to the person who gave it to you, otherwise the demons will get you. And then we also have the angels of affliction here. The Let's angel, stop. the Suriel Sar ha, Panem, is, isn't Panem something about inner face? or uh, no, the face, yeah, the, the face. So how would that translate to an angel? It's it's a... That was his name. His name is Sur Suriel Sarah Panem, who, uh, who who did not reveal his face. Oh, okay. Thank you. How do you spell the names of those demons? Sir? How do you spell them? Yeah. It's um, is, is yeah. I S T A L G A N I S. I S T A L G E S T I S. Thank the you. other one is Tachsefis. Oh, oh, that's the one I heard you say. T-A-C-H-S-E-F-I-S. T-A-C-H. S-E-F-I-S. X-E-F-I-S. Anyway, we're getting better. It's getting better. Don't worry. I'm a Rabbi Shubham oh. Levi. You should always know <laughs> that if you ever see Rabbi Shubham Levi or Rabbi Rabbi Babarachana, you know there's going to be something interesting. So I'm Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Yeshua ben Levi said, Three things were told to me by the angel of death. Okay, there's a one day we'll study the Gemara where Rabbi ben Levi um, uh, has a uh, conversation with the angel of death. But this is what he says: Al tito Do not take your shirt in the morning from the hand of the butler and get dressed. 
Do not have your hands washed by someone who has not washed their hands. Do not stand in front of women when they are returning from a funeral. Because I dance and come before them with my sword in hand. And I have permission to harm those who I meet. All righty then. <clears throat> Fair enough. <laughs> Don't want to be messing with any of that. <laughs> Gemara continues, I'll pug on my takante, and if you encounter them, what is the remedy to escape harm? You should jump four amas from your place. If there's a river, you should cross it. And if there's a road, you should go on it. The Iika Gudda Lake Ahura, and if there's a wall, you should stand behind it until the woman pass. The Eloi, and if these options are not available, the either Ape Vilema, you should turn your face away from the women and you should say the following verse by Yoimer Hashem al Hasatan Yiga Hashem Bakhab Gaimer. And Hashem said to the Satan, Hashem will denounce you, O Satan. Ad Shilakhofa Mine and repeat it until the woman pass by him. That was a big jump from cabbage. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the Talmud. Little, uh... well, actually, there's a quote by Kurt Vonnegut in, I'm trying to remember which of his books, perhaps Galapagos, um, that he begins the book by saying uh, an old Romanian um, uh, uh, saying is that any book that starts with beats ends with the devil. So it's consistent. We started with cabbage and we're ending with the devil. It's consist devil, consistent with um, Romanian folktales. There we go. Specifically a Romanian folktale. I think we're going to end here today because next week we're actually finishing the whole chapter. Okay. We don't have enough time to finish the whole chapter today, but we're going to finish chapter seven next week. Lola, did you want to say goodbye? You good? All of you. Yeah, you had better hurry. Hop to it. Walk with intention. Lola would like to. Lola. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh oh. Uh, there we go. So... Oh, we have a friend. <laughs> Hello, it's Ray friend. Skywalker. Ray Skywalker. Jedi cat. <laughs> Guys, uh, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Celeste, Shabbat Shalom. Your, your husband should have an easy time in the Rafua Shlema. I mean, I mean, thank you so much. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Bye. 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 Bye.